Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Rick Wilson. I'm in the uh, political science department uh, here at Rice. Um, I want to thank um, Moshe, who's not here, for organizing this. Thank Tony um, for pushing this thing along. I have a long history with uh, this particular DeLang conference. We started it in 2019 when I was director of Ciencia. And a small thing like COVID got in the way. And uh, so here we are three or four years out of sync where, from where we should have been. Uh, I always hate to follow Dan in a talk because he steals all my thunder. And he's so optimistic in many ways. And so uh, we're going to do good cop, bad cop today. So Dan was good cop. I'm, I'm not going to be. So to move forward, um, Technology is needed, there's no doubt about that, uh, in order to ensure carbon sequestration and reducing greenhouse gases, it's critical. And alternative forms of energy are needed, and Dan laid out the case for that. But in the end, it's a people problem. And um, I'm gonna talk about, at length, about that problem and what it means. So let me start with a very short poll. All of those of you who agree that uh, it's important to reduce CO2 emissions, would you raise your hands? Gee, I think pretty much it's, uh, everybody is pretty much unanimous on that. There's no doubt about it. Well, I'm gonna ask you to do something else. So let's ask what you've done in, to reduce CO2 emissions. And what I'm gonna want you to do is, I want everyone to raise their hand, keep it up, and then uh, if, if you haven't done this, you may lower your hand, okay? What about recycling routinely? Good, you guys are doing well. Switch to an hybrid or an EV. Uh, that's a little tougher. Here's mine, early adopter, 2017 Bolt, okay? Uh, installed solar panels, excellent. Dan and I are gonna be in a race on this one, I think. Uh, so, so here I am washing, my, or I'm washing my solar panels to keep them clean uh, because they do absorb dirt and other stuff in Houston. Um, taken one or few airplane trips in the last 12 months. All right. You'll notice I'll, I'll have pick and choose chosen things here. Uh, had one or few children. No, 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 you, you guys are putting your hands back up, you can't. I'm just counting the people who have <laughs> continued to uh, do all of these things, okay? And switch to a vegetarian diet. You and I are both in the same boat here. I, uh, I've done many things, but I can't give that up, okay? I still consume meat uh, on occasion. All right. So you, you'll notice I've probably cherry-picked my questions here uh, in terms of ways to reduce uh, your CO2 emissions as, in, as individuals. And I saved the hardest, you know, for me, the hardest to last. But I have cherry-picked these things. There's, there's no doubt about that. So I'm not big into, um, well, actually, I probably am, big into social shaming over um, CO2 emissions, but that's kind of what happens. So, um, the question is, I think, uh, here's the grim news. Our best intentions are probably not going to do it. So can all of us work in unison to reduce our CO2 emissions? Probably not. Um, what we can see is that, you know, there's this inexorable march to increasing CO2 emissions, as Dan pointed out earlier. Uh, we did have a major shock. In, uh, with COVID-19, 2020, and what happened? There's a big dip, about a 5.4% uh, uh, decrease in carbon emissions in that year period. Humans traveled less, humans drove less, humans consumed less. Uh, so that was all good news. People can make a difference and make a big dent. It wasn't a non-trivial dent, that was a big dent. Now, the downside is there was a quick rebound. Um, um, and it's the extent to which, as Dan noted earlier, 
it doesn't look like the line in the sand that was drawn at a 1.5 centigrade, centigrade um, increase in, in temperatures is not going to hold. Okay, And in fact, many of signatories to many of the agreements have uh, started backing down from that position. Okay, so why isn't this an easy problem to solve? Uh, we know the problem. Uh, the problem is increasing carbon emissions. We know um, what the proximate cause of the problem is. It's humans, it's us. Uh, unfortunately, we can't mandate extinction. Um, we might be doing a good enough job of that ourselves, but the fact is, you know, we are the problem. It's possible uh, that we could mandate some kind of solution by getting nations to act in concert. Uh, but so far, there's been lots and lots of commitments, and we've seen uh, mixed success at best with those commitments because commitments are easy to withdraw from. We saw that in certainly the, uh, the U.S. position in 2017 when we had a president who unilaterally acted to withdraw us from a particular uh, agreement. So how do we get people to act in concert? Um, how do, you, how do you get people to bind themselves to agreements? At the core is some really tough problems. These are dilemmas that I think we need to be aware of. We are, we're all aware of them, but I'm, just, I'm gonna reiterate them nonetheless. But these dilemmas pr produce incentives that lead to really perverse individual uh, behavior. So let's start first with, with public goods. We all know about public goods. We see them all the time. We like some public goods like clean air, clean water, uh, public safety. Uh, these goods have two really important dimensions to them. Uh, first of all, unrestricted access. So all of us can share in the consumption of the good. And moreover, there's no subtractability in use, okay? What this means is that my use of the good doesn't impact your use of the good, doesn't, do, doesn't interfere with your use. So in terms of public safety, that's a great thing. Uh, I get to enjoy public safety, you get to enjoy public safety, we all get to enjoy public safety, and my enjoyment doesn't detract from yours. But the problem with public goods, of course, is that we all understand that the core problem here is our incentive to free ride um, on the actions of others. So here's an example of free riding. Um, and you know, if everyone relies on someone else uh, to provision the good, public good won't happen. Now, one solution, of course, with public goods, the standard uh, uh, version that economists and, and political scientists uh, point to is that you can compel action. Uh, you can compel the provisioning of the good. So in the case of clean air, clean water, the EPA is entitled to, to fine individual corporations that, that might be polluting, generating externalities by fouling the water or the air. Uh, citizens, all of us, are taxed to provide certain forms of public goods like public safety, et cetera. Uh, and so we can have um, a, a, an external force that mandates um, our, our provisioning of such goods, okay? But the public goods problems often involve just shirking, as we see here. And that shirking means that you don't really, uh, unless you can have a, an entity that can force provisioning of the good, you're not gonna get it. Well, that's not exactly true, and I'll come to that a little bit later. But this isn't really the problem that we're facing with greenhouse gas emissions or global warming. I think the dilemma is different. So the dilemma is really one of the commons. And a, a, you can think of the classic case of the commons as having a commonly shared um, grazing land. Uh, and we all get to have free access to that grazing land. So there's unrestricted access. It's just like a public good in a sense in, in which one can't be kept from using the commons. Now the problem with the commons, of course, is that if uh, there is subtractability in use, unlike a public good. So 
in a commons, if I decide that I want to go put my cow on the commons and graze, great, I can do that. And for every unit of grass that's grazed by my cow, that doesn't leave a unit for somebody else to graze. So what do I do? I just ramp up the number of cows that I have, and I, and so do uh, so do my neighbors. And before you know it, we've destroyed the commons. Well, there's lots of examples of this. So fisheries, forests, greenhouse gases, I think, are all related in this sense. So again, it's this weird thing about subtractability. So once I consume a unit, no one else can consume that. That leads me to want to consume as much as possible. So here's an example of a fishery in which no one's restricted. Okay, small river, many fishermen, poor fish. They are facing a rough road here. Okay, well, how is this related in a sense to greenhouse gases? Well, again, this unrestricted access to carbon, um, unrestricted access to uh, consuming fossil fuels. And for every carbon unit that I consume, it's one you can't. Um, this uh, will present uh, an externality, greenhouse gases, uh, carbon emissions. And so, you know, it's, it's a tough problem. So what kind of solutions might there be to these kinds of problems? Well, each dilemma has its own different incentives for people. Public goods, I'm going to shirk on the efforts of others. Uh, a commons, I'm going to use the commons and overconsume, consume as much as I can, because there's no point in letting somebody else take my uh, fish or my carbon unit uh, if, if I can do the same thing. Now, we could have a centralized entity solve the problem for us, and in a public goods, as already noted, you could force people to uh, make mandatory contributions, provisioning the good, thereby you know, preventing shirking. In a commons, you could limit extraction or you could limit consumption, but that seems to be kind of a tough problem. So what, what kind of centralized entity can you get to act uh, on this? So this is the problem of uh, what Thomas Hobbes would have called the Leviathan, okay? Basically, you hand over the power to a single entity to solve the problem of the commons. That is, they can mandate who gets, you know, you can restrict access, you can, you know, in that setting, or you can restrict consumption. But who wants to cede over that kind of authority? And this is a central problem that international agreements face. I mean, we have, uh, you know, we have 194 signatories to, to the Paris Accords. But who compels adherence to those agreements? Moreover, where's the international court that's going to solve disagreements over the agreements? And how does it get adjudicated? We don't have an entity for that. We have independent states all acting in their own interest um, uh, to pursue whatever it is that the state decides it wants to pursue hopefully sometimes at the behest of the people who elect those officials, but not always, okay? And worse, there's still further dilemmas. So I'm gonna quickly go through those. Uh, we do have international nations differ in terms of what they consume, okay? So you can see in the upper uh, total greenhouse gas emissions, and then the lower figure there shows uh, per capita greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so nations vary. Um, if you put this in the context of the commons and the fishery, some nations have big boats to go out and catch fish, and some nations have canoes. And they're going to they're gonna take very different amounts of fish from the commons. And you can imagine that the big boats are going to take more. So China and the U.S. may be up there in terms of what they extract and consume, which we know that's true. So how do you get those nations to then realize that in their position, uh, they may have to change uh, their consumption patterns? Well, 
At the same time, not only do nations vary in terms of their consumption, but also in terms of the costs. And this has been a, this is this was the core of COP27, um, which just met. And the key concern was who pays, uh, which nations um, that might be bearing the greatest short-term costs. How do they get compensated? Is it compensation or is it mitigation? The question, is, you know, it's a fundamental question. Should poor nations be um, subsidized, in a sense, by large nations? Well, you could take the Swiss position. How do you get equity for your carbon footprint? Swiss are um, paying to install efficient lighting and cleaner stoves in, in, um, in Ghana for about five million households. This is wonderful, but are the Swiss doing anything to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions? No, all they're doing is offloading their carbon footprint onto other countries, which is probably a beneficial thing. But nonetheless, it allows the Swiss to meet their greenhouse goal emissions by getting other countries to mitigate their own emissions. Okay, maybe, maybe fair. Is that fair? Well, what is fair? Well, it could be that um, you can't halt development in an inequitable way. Um, who's going to tell India that they've got to curb their air conditioning? Okay. Uh, geez, you know, we all live in Houston and we all have air conditioning and it makes our lives wonderful. But, you know, that's fine. We were there first. What do we do? You know, those other countries can, you know, figure out something else. Uh, maybe we can buy them off and, and uh, tell them they really don't need air conditioning. That's probably not a very equitable or fair thing to think about. Now, aside from contemporary fairness, um, we've got to be concerned in some ways with future fairness. So it's just not fairness across nations that may differ in capacity or, or growth or, or development may have to be concerned with the future. But why? Um, IBG is wonderful. I'll be gone. What do I care if the projections at uh, you know, the end of this century come, come true, as, as many have pointed to, if we're increasing you know, temperatures and so, so forth? I'm old. I'm not going to be around. So why should I care about the future? Um, Moreover, why should I sacrifice my current consumption for benefits that I'm not going to enjoy? This is a serious problem. We would like it to be the case that we all think about the future. Well, okay, I was gonna be bad cop. I think there's some hope. Those who are most affected now and in the future are becoming active. They're becoming activists. This is great. It's what's needed. Um, the um, the future doesn't need my leadership, okay? The future needs uh, the leadership of, the, of those who are going to be affected. The other point I'm going to talk about, and this is where I'm gonna spend a little bit of time going into stuff that I really like to deal with, which are social science experiments, is that people aren't completely selfish. They're not like me, who don't care because I'll be gone, who don't care because I'm gonna consume as much as I possibly can right now and leave it to others to solve the problem, the mess I've created. Okay, so people are not completely selfish. So this is, this is, a, this is a big claim. Um, and you might not believe me, but I'm gonna take you through a set of experiments that, uh, that some friends of mine have conducted and I've done a lot of public goods experiments too. And I'm often, my natural tendency to be grumpy is offset sometimes by the fact that uh, um, uh, I, I see, I see non-selfish behavior. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about the disaster game. Uh, the disaster game is a public goods game. It's very simple. I start with an endowment. Uh, in all these experiments, people are making cash. Okay, so, so their decisions are, are meaningful. Okay, and we're trying to extract the basic core of the problem in order to understand uh, behavior. So 
I start with an endowment. I can keep all of my endowment. I can shirk. I can free ride. Uh, but I risk, run the risk that I lose uh, my endowment, as does everybody else in my group. Okay, how do I lose it? Well, there's a disaster coming. I know what the probability of that disaster is, and I got to meet a threshold. The group has to meet a threshold. None of us can do that individually, but the group acting in concert can contribute to the threshold. And if we make the threshold, we eliminate um, uh, the likelihood of a disaster. So disaster is averted. So my contribution decision is private. Um, you can see on the left, they don't meet the threshold. The disaster probability is put into play. Uh, you might lose everything. Uh, on the right-hand side, if you meet the threshold, great. You avert the disaster. The money to avert the disaster disappears, and you're left with whatever you have in terms of your, um, um, your, your private endowment that you get. Okay, so that's a standard public goods game with a threshold. Um, and you know, the good news is with a Leviathan, you know, the threshold is always met because the taxing authority can say, you are gonna contribute X amount and you can actually optimize the amount that's paid and, and the threshold will always be met. There's no Leviathan in these games. People don't get to talk to each other. They make their decisions privately. They don't get feedback um, until after they see what happens, uh, what, after the threshold is made or not made. So the good news is people often meet the threshold without collusion. That is, they're not able to communicate with one another. And you can think of this maybe as disaster mitigation. So people are acting for the group and not in a selfish way. Now, um, so that's, that I guess is good news. Disasters can be averted. Okay, now what about acting for others? That was one of those other alternative dilemmas I talked about. Uh, can we, uh, it, it's often the case that we know that we care about our own group and you can create artificial groups that you actually care about, though why you do, I, I have no idea. Well, actually I do have an idea, but, but it's amazing that people do care about artificial groups, okay? Now the question is, can you care about others who are not related to you at all and, and they're not of the same group and, and so forth. So I'm gonna look at the same game as before, um, but now your contribution to meet the threshold is to a different group. And you don't even know who that group is because it's gonna be a different random group that's chosen. And so there are many groups. One random group is gonna be chosen. You're gonna be contributing to that threshold. There are many such groups, so some other random group will be chosen to see if they can get you up to the threshold, okay? So you're no longer create, uh, contributing to your own meeting the threshold in order to mitigate the disaster. What you're doing is helping somebody else that you don't know. And there's no possibility of reciprocity. That is, it's not like you're gonna be interacting with these people um, ever again. So what do we have? Well, people do help other gr groups meet their threshold. Again, like I said, it's not due to reciprocity. And this happens even when groups are in very different countries. The great thing about the internet is that you can play these, uh, run these experiments out in countries all over the world. Okay, and even when you know it's another country, uh, if, if which you have no likelihood of ever meeting those people. Uh, we still get uh, the case that uh, there's contributions. So, good news, finally. Uh, centralized authority is not required. People do well. Um, um, they understand the problem and they act accordingly. They don't always make the threshold. They don't always do what you would expect, but they do it more often than not. Okay, so this is good news. And people are willing to help out others. So this may mean that the poor Republic of the Maldives with no more than, you know, which is no more than six and a half feet above sea level on average. Actually, not on average, that's the peak. That, that's their mountain in the Maldives. You know, with 
continued greenhouse gas emissions, they're going to be underwater. All right, so we're willing to help others. That's good. All right, now let's go to a slightly more complicated version of this, which deals with the commons. It's a different kind of problem. It's a more complicated problem, um, but um, nonetheless, let's see if we can uh, build an experiment that, that tests this out. So it has two phases. First, first phase is you decide how much you want to extract. This is a commons problem. So the extraction is typically across periods. There's a replenishment rate in the commons. If you take too much too quickly, uh, you crash the commons, the commons disappears, and nothing more can be extracted by anyone, okay? The second stage then is you decide how much you want to contribute to this old public goods game to mitigate the disaster. Now, the problem is the harvest rate is going to determine the threshold, okay? Um, so uh, you're, you're going to be facing this problem of um, the more you take in the harvest phase, the less likely you're going to be able to meet an increasing threshold. Okay? So the two things are tied together. Now the expectation, of course, is that there's going to be over-extraction, that, that you're going to trash the commons pretty quickly, and you're going to make it very likely that whatever you have in the second phase, the disaster phase, is going to be wiped out. So you're, you're basically... In technical terms, you're screwing yourself and your group, okay? So I, I look at this game because th this, one's, this one gets to the point of intergenerational transfers, okay? One of those dilemmas I pointed to where I'll be gone, I don't care. So the game is played this way. You have um, old timers who play 10 rounds of the extraction game, the commons, and then they have newcomers who watch for the first five periods and then they enter in the last five periods. Okay, it's, you know, it, 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 it's intended to look at intergenerational transfers and it does so in the following way. It creates disparities in wealth. The design is really good at ensuring there are these wealth disparities between the two groups. People who are at it longer are gonna make more, especially if they figure out not, you know, w whether they shouldn't over harvest. Um, so what happens? Well, it turns out the old timers are willing to curtail their harvesting, anticipating that there's going to be a new group of people coming along who are not going to have the same benefits and the same uh, wealth. So the old timers cut back on how, how much they harvest. And the old timers also in the second stage, the disaster phase, tend to over-contribute in meeting the threshold means people do care about the future. People care about the future that's not theirs, somebody else's future. Okay, newcomers, you know, they're not willing to uh, contribute to the threshold as much, but they're depending on the old timers. So this idea of intergenerational transfers and disparate wealth tends to, tends to work out uh, pretty well. So the good news uh, is that inequality in something that affects choices uh, means that people I have are altruistic. Let me, let me backpedal, can be altruistic in many of these settings. And you can vary these settings in a lot of different ways. Likewise, people can be concerned with future generations. So I... Uh, you know, it, it's maybe, maybe a good thing. It may even play out to the fact that governments, nations, can coordinate in reaching these agreements if the governments are representative of their citizens. You know, so we like to think of nations as being independent agents. They act on their own. But really, nations are built up of their citizens. And even in dictatorial regimes. Um, and so the things that we're observing in people may also drive governments to want to work together um, in terms of coordinating. More importantly, 
I think local solutions can work. Um, groups can see that the, the dilemmas that they face and they can solve them, okay? Uh, people are really pretty good about solving localized problems. Of course, sadly, climate change is not a local, only a localized problem. It's a, it's, it's a much broader problem than that. Okay. So I'm hoping that's good news, maybe. So in the end, um, what should we do? Uh, Sylvia noted it. Uh, Dan noted it. Uh, it's our task to put a lot of pressure on our public officials. Believe it or not, some public officials are pretty responsive to citizen requests and citizen concerns. So, um, you know, voting is, is a useful activity. Uh, letting public officials know what they need to do is a useful activity. Uh, making sure people understand your preferences are, you know, is a useful activity. All of these things can be used to put pressure on public officials. Dan was in, you know, in, in his talk, talked about this link between, you know, public policy and technology, uh, and it's, public policy is not decided in a vacuum, as, as he well knows. It comes from the push by others, and uh, all of us have that responsibility to do so. I'd also suggest you could keep doing your part you know, we went through the exercise of who was doing what. There are a lot of little things that you can do and should continue to do in order to mitigate some of the greenhouse gas emissions. And so that's a good thing. You know, keep it up. Even if you can't do everything, doing something is better than nothing. Um, and then I think another point is to learn to discuss what we share in common. So one of the questions that was asked of Dan earlier, you know, was you know, the, the, the horrible experience we all have at Thanksgiving dinners with people who don't share our, our beliefs. Uh, you know, how do you, how do you approach that? And I'd actually ask you to watch uh, maybe Catherine Hayhoe's uh, Ciencia lecture from a couple of years ago, or any time you can look, uh, see something that Catherine Hayhoe has talked about, because she spends a lot of time talking exactly how do you address people with whom you do not share the same values, and how do you reach agreement over things that might be valuable, useful. Okay, so I'm also going to ask you to take this advice, so we can switch. You've, you've heard enough from me right now. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you hear from my avatar instead. I'm Rick Wilson, a social scientist in the Department of Political Science at Rice the, University. Uh, it should be no surprise to you, but problems associated with climate change are human made. While seeking technological solutions to sequester carbon emissions are very worthwhile, ultimately the source of those em emissions is people. My research tries to figure out how to get people to change their behavior so that it's aligned with their interests. Some know this as behavioral nudging. A simple example is, how do you get people who want to be comfortable in their house or apartment to dial up their air conditioning to 80 degrees? Well, in most households in Houston, this could result in 25 to 35 percent in energy savings. But showing the savings doesn't nudge people to change their behavior. Showing people what their neighbors are doing and what it means for them does matter. I'm going to start with a simple principle. Act local and think global. Well, let's take Rice. We have an internationally active faculty. That's the great news. The bad news is that we fly everywhere. Last fiscal year, Rice paid for approximately 10,500 air flights. Many were multiple legs, but I'll assume they're all a single leg. Suppose the average flight was to Los Angeles. This would be the equivalent to adding more than 6,400 metric tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. To put that in context, this is the equivalent to putting an additional 2,426 cars on Houston streets for a year. 
before, contributing to the melting of about 5,000 square meters of the ice pack. These are eye-opening numbers, but what can we do? Well, it starts locally. One approach is to simply buy carbon offsets for each flight you take, or plant 22 trees, but this does not address the fact that you're still taking that flight. A second approach is for Rice to limit the number of flights it pays for each year, or make you pay for your own flights. While this would cut back on travel, it would be unfair. Junior faculty need to attend conferences, and they need to carry out the research. To limit them might ruin their careers, although a recent study by Seth Wines et al. suggests otherwise. A third approach, fly shaming, has taken root in Europe. Rather than opting for air travel, there is a strong push for taking public transportation, including rail service. This is feasible in Europe, but not so much in the United States, and much less so in Houston. At present, it's very difficult to get to either coast by train. It seems that fly shaming in its current guise won't work locally. So what to do? As Wines and Nichols point out, you can try to substitute various actions to reduce your CO2 emissions, but much of what you can do has less of an impact than canceling a single transatlantic flight. Of course, giving up your car, choosing to have one less child will do more, but canceling a flight seems more likely. The next time an opportunity comes up to fly to a conference, ask yourself, do I really need to go? Is there a closer regional conference where I might get the same feedback? The next time you get invited to give a talk, why not ask, can I Skype in to deliver my talk? The next time your department decides to invite someone in to give a talk, ask, can that speaker do this via Zoom? Well, the university has invested a lot of resources in making our seminar and classrooms internet accessible. So go for it. I recognize the inherent collective action problem. My rational strategy is to continue flying and let others bear the externalities for my actions. But, as we know, this is not sustainable. The next generations will bear the cost. Think about what your local actions mean for the global commons. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Who knew you were going to get a cartoon? Um, yeah, two questions about the tragedy of the commons framing. Um, can it be taught in a way that separates it from Garrett Hardin, who popularized it and known white supremacist, eugenicist, used it to justify, you know, calling for uh, removing genes from the gene pool and for banning food aid that would only make things worse? Um, so are there people who put this forward without those ties. And the other thing is, is this even the right framing uh, that makes sense in terms of if it's using less flights or turning up the thermostat, there is a personal sacrifice or a personal loss that we have for the greater good. But the sorts of examples I was saying, if it's building out cleaner ways of making hydrogen, if it's enhanced geothermal, if it's heat pumps, if it's anything that the transitions us away from using fossil fuels, it's both local gain and global gain. It's um, moving, it's reducing our local air pollution, our local water pollution, our local environmental justice problems. It's building out industries that are going to be demanded globally as there start being more and more pushes to demand clean steel, clean cement, cleaner hydrogen, countries that won't buy internal combustion engines anymore. So what happens if if we get to a point where what we need most is actually investing in things that have local gain and, and global gain, um, and it's not just a uh, everyone for themselves consuming a finite resource framing. So yes, a good set of questions. Okay, so let me answer the first part. Uh, yes, the, the, the commons has been treated differently from you know, Garrett Hardin. So, a um, woman who won the Nobel Prize a few years ago, Lynn Ostrom, who spent her career uh, focusing on the problems of how do you go from the ground up to solve fundamental commons problems. And you know, she spent a lot of time looking at forests and water and 
and, and fisheries and things like those. But th those are pretty well-defined areas. And she always had a problem with how do you handle the, the ocean? How do you handle fisheries you know, that, are, that are open access, like in the oceans? And how do you, what do you do to try and solve those problems? And, and, and there aren't any localized solutions for things like that. Same with greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera. So it's, it's kind of, as you scale up to things like climate change, you face really tough dilemmas. And I think trying to get those easily resolved is not, it, it isn't gonna happen. Now, to take the second part of your question, I think you're actually right on target with saying, you know, a lot of the solutions that we have for climate change are local. We can make clear decisions that affect our local communities in ways that, you know, may benefit the local communities. We're not going to solve the, 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 the international problems that way. But as we make progress in, you know, how do we get more cars off the freeway in Houston? How do, you know, how do we switch to electric vehicles? How do we do this, this or this in order to reduce greenhouse gases? Well, that can be handled at kind of the local level. The city, the state, the nation, you know, can address those issues pretty directly. And we see a lot of evidence that that's happening. So in that sense, um, it's, it's not the Leviathan stepping in and saying, this is what we're going to do. It would be nice if that could happen, but it, you know, no one's going to agree to that. But in terms of having um, generating ground up solutions, I think that's, that's where it's gotta happen. Maybe a little slower than we wish, but I think that's where we go. You're near the mic, Vivian, go ahead. <laughs> I, I loved your talk, um, and it's so, so clearly expressed. So, thanks. This is probably gonna be unpopular, but you know, just the fact that you talked about maybe having a university policy to re restrict travel, you know, I think that's a wonderful idea. Part of me, you know, I sort of thought this summer, everybody was on Facebook talking about the trips we were making and, and showing this. And, and, and I went to Europe, you know, I wanted to take my son to see his grandparents, and, and so that was a big deal. But part of me is also, you know, we have such great streaming videos, so like, I don't need to go to the Arctic or Antarctica, you know, to see penguins and watch glaciers and do all this stuff. We have so much more access that you could sit at home and see these stuff. I'm actually happy, I hate flying, so I'm happy staying at home, and, and you know it's nice to know there are elephants out there, and I don't know, need to go see them myself to know they're there. So, so my question is, you know, do we need to rely on government to have more of this education to the, the population of this is how much you're consuming and this is how much you should cut? Do we need to have more societal shaming? Uh, you know, how do, we, how do we get there? Because I feel as though we are not, um, pressing individual consumers to conserve as much as they really could, as you, as you showed in your first, you know, when you opened your talk. So uh, I don't think I would be in, in favor of having uh, mandates by some entity like the provost or the president saying we must stop flying, et cetera. I, I, I do think that uh, the economic incentives at work right now, especially for, you know, doing things to your house, you know, you're gonna have far more payoffs. And so the, the market may lead in some ways a lot of our decisions. Now, something simple like flying, you know, I'm, I'm really mixed on this. Uh, I haven't flown for a while. And I see the benefits of interacting with colleagues in a face-to-face -face way that I don't get off of Zoom. So, uh, you know, on the one hand, does it improve your ability to make breakthroughs in science by just being on Zoom? Probably not. Is there a lot of serendipity involved in interacting with people? I think there is. So 
I would like to see, this is why we have a university. We can all walk around, wander around, talk to each other. And occasionally we get new ideas. Yes. What, um, how do you uh, address the argument that uh, develop, developing nations have uh, relative to the commons in which uh, now, for example, the developed nations have been uh, through industry, uh, transportation, why not? They have uh, already evolved quite a bit, but they are just coming up. So how do you address that uh, in, a, in an environment in which you have a lot of people to need to commit to that? Well, I think that's one of our key uh, problems. It's not only cross nations, but also intergenerational. And how do we, how do we address uh, the disparities? And so there is uh, inequalities in, in uh, mitigation. Uh, should, we be, you know, should we be denying other uh, countries from enjoying what we have? And we probably shouldn't. But I think COP27 was, COP27 was, was, was really an effort to try and address that problem. So I, I'm hopeful that we can act in concert. I'm far more hopeful that the mix of technology and the push of policymakers is going to make a huge difference. And the carrot stick notion that Dan talked about, I think, is critical for what we do in this country and probably for what other countries do as well. So at some, at some point, maybe, maybe uh, future generations will have a chance. I'm hopeful. Strange for me to be hopeful, but I am. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.